Welcome to the eighth in the 2016 series of the Digital Classicist Seminar in London. Um, this is the penultimate seminar, and we're extremely um, happy and privileged this week to have uh, Stelios Kronopoulos from Freiburg um, here to talk to us about new life into old courses using digital tools in reading and prose composition classes. And I'll pass over to Stelios, he'll tell us uh, exactly what that means um, and everything. Thank you very much, uh, Gabi, and thank you, all of you, for uh, Yes, yes, yes. We have. Uh, actually, I feel very privileged uh, for being here and uh, having the opportunity to present you uh, a small experiment I did uh, with two of my classes in uh, Freiburg. Uh, after having uh, come into contact uh, with uh, two different digital tools for uh, linguistic analysis and uh, for text alignment. And I will show you how uh, I tried to use them to implement them in really analogical courses uh, of uh, Greek prose composition and um, close reading. These courses are an important part of the formal education of classical philologists in Germany. Producing a correct text in Greek or Latin and translating an original classical text in German are considered basic and indispensable skills. Nevertheless, these courses are taught rather intuitively than reflectively systematically. They are considered an application of knowledge acquired in grammar courses and they are based on practice and ad hoc error correction with some explanation. After having taught such courses for some years now, I consider this way of teaching to be a serious problem. It seems to me important and necessary to introduce a higher degree of systematization to lead and support reflection about specific phenomena and problems and to demonstrate concretely and continuously the importance of abstraction in the process of transferring content from one language to another. There are of course attempts to introduce translation theory into reading courses of classics and the textbook uh, of uh, Leonor, uh, Leonor Dickey, An Introduction to the Composition Analysis of Greek Prose, published some months ago, is an excellent resource that facilitates both systematization and the combining of composition and translation exercises. What I would like to present and discuss with you today is an experiment to introduce digital tools for linguistic analysis and text alignment in courses of prose composition and close reading, respectively. My starting hypothesis was that such digital tools would extend the way students interact with texts, both as readers and producers, enhance conscious consciousness, and thus promoting learning. Being obliged, being obliged to deal with the formalisms of a digital tool, being obliged to make explicit some decisions and choices that otherwise remain implicit, and being obliged to notice exactly what you know and what you don't know, could offer considerable support in the attempt to produce texts or translate more consciously. Finally, the visualizations produced may allow to compare elements of the text more easily, to see dependencies and parallelisms. It seems to me useful at this point to show you the two digital tools I used, simply in order to give a concrete idea of how they look like. In a minute, I'll introduce them in some detail, but for the beginning, let's have a small uh, look at the tools and how uh, they they are. I simply pick some uh, of the linguistic analysis I have done for my own for my own research, and this is 
how the linguistic analysis tool looks like. Here is a sentence that has been analyzed, the first verse of Aristophanes' um, birds. And this is the structured analysis of the sentence, and each word has uh, its, uh, also its own morphological uh, recognition. Uh, I suppose, hmm? oops. Uh, yeah. Not really. You cannot see it. Is it okay? Is it better? Okay. As I said, I want only uh, to show you now simply the tools and not explain them in order to have a concrete idea of what we are talking about. Uh, the other tool is the tool of uh, translation al alignment or uh, alignment of uh, different uh, text texts, sorry, and this is one of the sentences we will show later. Uh, and here we have two different texts that are aligned to each other, and we can quickly see what word what word translate what, what word. Sometimes two words are translated with one. Sometimes the opposite, and of course there are also elements that are not translated. But about that more later. Oops. Let me now add some more details about the main hypothesis uh, that I formulated and then formulate concisely the aims of the experiment. The interaction of the students with the formalisms of a digital tool, and this is more relevant for the tree banking tool, means actually that they interact with the scholars and the scholarly work done to create this tool, the knowledge invested into it, and the conventions used. Or, put it in another way, they realize in praxis that the grammatical and syntactic nomenclature that they are used to employ is conventional, that other conventions also exist, and that linguistic de description presupposes a certain, I would say, high degree of abstraction. Turning implicit decisions and choices into explicit ones means that errors done either by producing a text in the prose composition or by producing a translation and, and are due to a lack of reflection about the differences between different languages, in our case the native language of the students and ancient Greek, can be easily corrected. And the same can be true concerning a more conscious way to handle the unknown. The basic practical aim introducing the tree banking tool into the prose composition class was to enable students spot more easily errors in the Greek texts they had produced. What types of errors? I must admit I did not start with a very definite idea about that. The basic practical aim in introducing the text alignment tool into the close reading class was to enable students to see where exactly the difficulties of the original text lie and how translators, interpreters in different language, languages had addressed them. The concept of the experiment must be viewed in the background of similar implementations of digital tools for linguistic analysis and text alignment for didactic purposes. There is already experience in using tree banking tools in courses of close reading to facilitate students deeply analyze original texts in Greek and Latin, understand and name syntactic structures, understand exactly problems related to textual criticism, produce visualization of structures, and eventually compare periods on the basis of their syntactic structures. The recent article of Francesco Mambrini 
the ancient Greek dependency tree bank, linguistic annotation and teaching environment in the volume edited uh, by uh, Gabi and uh, Romanello, explores these possibilities and presents some results. In the experiment I would like to share with you today, I introduced a tree banking tool provided by Perseid in a prose composition course not to let students analyze an original text, as Mambrini, for example, does, but Greek texts they have produced themselves and texts, obviously, that contain errors. There is also some experience in using alignment tools, especially to produce translations of original texts in language teaching environments and in order to assess vocabulary and structural elements of a foreign language using a translation. In my experiment, I introduced the alignment tool provided by Persis again in a closed reading course to give students the opportunity to compare different translations of difficult passages of Plato's Politicus. A side remark here, I regularly use translations in closed reading courses and students work with them almost as they do with the original text. I will now separate the two experiments and present first the introduction of the tree banking tool into the prose composition class. The difficulties I expected to encounter in my attempt to introduce the use of tree banking tool into the prose composition course were both practical and substantial. The practical concerned the introduction of digital tools into an environment designed to use exclusively analogical means, that means speech, paper, and blackboard, and a quite and had a quite strict workflow. Yes, I solved this difficulty the easy way, so I added some extra hours. Since the students were really willing to do that, and they were also curious, it was not an actual problem. But it is obvious this cannot be a permanent solution if we're going to go in that way. The substantial difficulty concerned the decision to start with an introduction to dependency grammar or to try to use a hands-on approach. The introduction offered, in my opinion, two important possibilities. First of all, consider the Arethusa environment, the tree banking environment I show you and I used and the tool in its scholarly context and view it as a product of a quite long grammatical and linguistic tradition. And the second one, to emphasize that every formalized description of relationships among speech and or text elements is based on theoretical premises and is not natural. So that's why I decided not to go for a hands-on approach that is also very, very effective as other experiments from colleagues have shown, but to go for introduction to which we devoted one session of two hours. Let me now go on into some basic elements of such an introduction as uh, we discussed it also with Gabby and since in the seminar there was no introduction to the tree banking, it could be perhaps for some of you at least uh, something new, although I, I dare to doubt it. Nevertheless, mainly for the purposes of the uh, broadcasting, I would like now to introduce shortly to the environment of the Arethusa tool, the tool of dependency tree banking of the Perseids platform. And we have already seen it uh, in a glimpse, and now we are going to see it in some more detail. There is a first, in the Perseids.org site, there is a first login site, and the login is quite easy, you can log in with a Google account and I have done that for myself and what I get is actually uh, my uh, working bench here with several alignments and tree banking uh, um, annotations I have done uh, to texts. This is my personal account and everything is saved here. 
Now, the basic principle of dependency grammar, and I can demonstrate that using the example again from the first verses of the birds. Let's take uh, this example. I have to make it a little bit bigger again, don't I? Uh, it's not really better, is it? Okay, there are three very important principles for dependency grammar. First of all, we have a hierarchical structure for representing relationships between words. That means the linear nature of the text is broken down into such hierarchical uh, structures that we also represent visually. That means also a series of decisions we have to take that word A depends from word B. And in that tool, it is actually a little bit more strict. Word A depends only from word B. And then we can also name the way, the, 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 the nature of this dependency depends from word B in such and such a way. It is, for example, an object or a subject to word B. E. The second basic principle used in that tool, at least, is that the basic unit is the word and not the phrase. We do not annotate relationship between phrases. We annotate and we create relationships between words. This is very, very important for dependency grammar. Of course, you can already imagine that we can come very, very, very uh, quickly uh, to limits. Intuitively, we want to say that an article and a, a noun is one thing and they belong very close together. No, in dependency grammar, we have to find a way to represent that in a hierarchical structure. The third important uh, aspect here is that there is an ontology to deal with the various relationships. And in Arethusa, the proposed ontology uh, is in the guidelines produced uh, by uh, Celano, now in the second uh, version. And you can have a first idea of these relations looking at this small list of abbreviation, it tells you nothing. At, at least it didn't tell me anything when I first saw that thing, mm, with some exceptions of SPJ or OBJ. Uh, but uh, otherwise, uh, you have really to go into the guidelines and understand what is described in what, in what way, to put it otherwise, to come into contact with this ontology and as every ontology, it has its own conventions. Important for the analysis is also the fact that the period is considered to be the unit to be analyzed. The period that ends with a full stop or with a semicolon is the basic un unit that we analyze. Not a clause, not a phrase, not several periods, but the period. This is extremely important when uh, more complicated phenomena, uh, when we have to address more complicated phenomena like ellipsis. Uh, but uh, this is the conventions, this is the formalism of this digital tool based on dependency grammar. The predicate is considered to be the nucleus of the sentence, and you see here the predicate period tail is the first node from which everything else depends. There is a second node depending on the root, and this is uh, the uh, punctuation here. Uh, and uh, it is, uh, punctuation is treated uh, separately uh, in this uh, formalism and uh, has its own ontology to describe it. Both elements are uh, dependent from this abstract unit root, which means sentence number 102, for example. The tool offer, offers mature support for annotation on two levels, on morphosyntactic 
on morphological level and syntactic level. And the morphological level uh, has also uh, some support for, from the Morpheus parser. So you get, when the word comes in, you get some suggestions of what could it be. And then you have to decide uh, what you think it is correct. Uh, of course, you can also override these uh, suggestions and uh, even correct them, uh, at least for your own purposes. Uh, using uh, the tool in your account. Now, a peculiarity of the formalism in this tool is that it does, does not allow for indicating that a word has eventually two different syntactic roles as other formalisms do. For example, the formalism of Croyel, another three banking tool, allows for double function, for double syntactic function. Let's say a noun that is simultaneously the object and the subject of the infinitive, the object of the predicate and the subject of an infinitive. Uh, this is not possible into this formalism, and this is why I said before. A word is dependent, uh, A is dependent from word B and only from word B. And uh, this is kind of um, restriction, at least my students uh, thought it is a restriction. I had to explain them that this is the formalism of the tool. And in the evaluation uh, of the, pro the experiment I will present you in a moment, uh, we, will, we can discuss uh, if uh, what what we can think about that. Now this was extremely short, extremely short. It has no no aspiration to be an introduction to whatever. It is simply for you in order to understand uh, what we are talking about. My students got a, a full two hours introduction into that with examples and uh, with some uh, information about dependence grammar and its history. Um, but they also try to uh, use uh, the tool. Now, the experiment that we did, uh, in the experiment that we did, we used the, level, the levels of morphological analysis and the syntactic relations, but not both in all cases. We started without morphological analysis at all, but only with syntactic annotation. And only later, we worked the other way around. The intention behind that was to understand practically and clearly how the two levels, the morphological and the syntactical levels, are intermingled, and at which point exactly of the translation process, students take decisions of what they should write. Do they take decisions on the basis of morphology, or do they take decisions on the basis of a more abstract idea about uh, construction? Now, let me present you what has been created. Create, well, yes, why not? Created in some sense. I show you now the, the, the uh, screenshot of that. It is easier for me. Um, it's not very transparent. May I get it bigger? Is it a little bit bigger? Can you see it more or less? Yes. This is the sentence my student, a student of mine, had to translate it, create. It is uh, Lysias 3.6. The translation of lamb reads, but I think it proper that you should hear the numerous offenses he has committed against myself. And this is the translation that my student produced. I think it's here Bertolt, but I don't know him. I asked him to tribank it. And she did fairly good, recognizing the predicate, the nomizo that he had created, 
recognizing that using Allah, he connects it with a previous, with a previous period, seeing that there is an object there, and then constructing, constructing the object with a, a queen and an ankyon as a predicate to this queen, and going on to the object of a queen exemartiken. When he came to the secondary clause, so the, the relative clause, the hosa eis eme auton, he had a problem. Because one simple word, one very small word, could not match in the schema, could not find any place. And this is this, is this de. De there is simply not correct. De there creates a kind of paratactical construction in a construction that is obviously a hypotactical one. It is a secondary relative clause, clear case of hypotaxis, and he uses a day that he could really not understand where to put it in the scheme. So he immediately, or not immediately, but he, he tried to find a way to put the there. He, who, he should create a kind of parallel construction to coordinate it with another element. He couldn't find it. The was obviously not correct, or at least was problematic. He should reflect more about that. It was not very long until he understood that the is wrong. This is the first sentence and the first example that has been produced. The second one the student Jack Laza recognized it in seconds or milliseconds, I would say. The sentence reads, the counts of the accusation are so many men of Athens. Oh, no, I'm sorry, this is not the one, this is one. But you had tidings that the 3,000 were divided by fraction and that the 30 were not at all of one mind. And the parallel construction here, Stasiatsontes and Echontes, coordinated through Kai and two participles play the same role. He put it erroneously in different casus. He recognized it in, in, in one second that the two elements must be in the same casus. This is also very obvious. The visualization helped him to do that, but I must admit that he, he saw it uh, before the visualization. Uh, at the moment when he was uh, obliged uh, to put them parallel to each other. Otherwise, the sentence works. Of course, my students found it really counterintuitively intuitive to put the article of several words as an attribute in a hierarchical uh, dependency from the word itself. This is simply the formalism, and there is no other answer to that. We discussed a long time about that, and in the evaluation, I have also a small remark about it. It is a strong formalism that it does not necessarily, is not necessarily close, at least in some cases, to what we think or how we visually analyze text in the linear format putting small arrows, connecting words and phrases, and not having, uh, not being obliged to analyze it only in words, but we can switch between words and phrases uh, uh, according to our needs. Now, let me go uh, to the evaluation. The evaluation occurred after two sessions of uh, annotating. Uh, so, all in all, together with the introduction, uh, six 
hours. It was very important for the students that they were obliged to break down the linear order of the text and represent the syntactic relationships in a strict hierarchical order. Because these gave them access to a new way of visualizing the text, of seeing it both ways, as a linear entity that they can read word by word as it is written, and as a construction of relationships in a hierarchical way. There were able to spot mainly the two types of errors that I show you. Congruence errors, the second uh, example, and errors concerning the connections between main and subordinate clauses. Of course, the morphological analysis allowed them to spot several morphological errors. Forms that they do not, do not exist, forms uh, that are problematic, and so on. But this, at least in my opinion, was not the most interesting part of the experiment, since it was simply a kind of, I put it in the TLG and I see if the word exists or not, or in which period it exists or not. So this was not, this was simply a help for them to create, to write correct uh, in Greek but not actually uh, an important result, at least, uh, for me and for them. But these two types of errors, they were able to, to spot them almost immediately and to correct them accordingly. Other types of errors, no. They, um, I didn't find any other type of errors that they could find out immediately uh, and uh, correct it. The interaction now with the digital tool, the conventions of the annotation system, where they, they understood them at the beginning as limits, as limits that there shouldn't be there, as limits that don't allow them really uh, to see what's going on and be creative uh, with uh, annotating the sentences. And this is because they are somehow used to the freedom the analog an analogical media give us. But exactly this strictness, exactly this uh, restriction was at the same time a very interesting way for them to think in a very, very consequent way. They were somehow obliged by the formalism of the digital tool to be as consequent as they could. And there is a balance there, obviously, and they expressed it also like that. There is a balance between freedom and uh, ad hoc best solutions and be as consequent as uh, possible. And uh, this balance, of course, uh, were for them a new experience because up to now they had only the experience of being free. Is it possible now to integrate the use of the tools permanently in a prose composition course? I don't know. I must be honest with you and with myself. Uh, the courses are really very, very strictly designed. They have a strict workflow. I could only integrate this kind of tool only in extra hours, as I said at the beginning. I cannot imagine now implementing them regularly in my courses, although I had promised to the students and they supported that, that we will try it again. So we will see if it works, perhaps with a regular course, with a regular course hour. At the very beginning of the, of the experiment, the students asked they were not very sure what does all this bring. Why is that important? Why are we doing that? Uh, is it somehow useful? It, they could not see uh, the, purposeful, the purposefulness of uh, the experiment. At the end of the experiment, 
they were persuaded that they have gained something. It was not very easy to, to name it. It was only after my guidance with these structured questions, okay, what was the result from the interaction with the formalism of the tool? What was the result seeing the hierarchical structure visualized and so on, that they gave some answers. But they didn't ask the question, what does all this bring? Not at all. It was not a question for them anymore. At the beginning, they had that uh, question. So at the end, they don't ask the question, but they don't see yet concretely and exactly in their own what's the purpose of all this. Now we are going uh, to the second uh, example, to the second experiment, the use of the text alignment, uh, alignment course in a close reading uh, class. Since the Persage tool that I saw you uh, in a glimpse, and uh, we will see it now uh, in detail, uh, for text alignment can be used almost intuitively, its integration in the course was actually very, very easy. It was a course where we read, as I told at the beginning, uh, a very difficult text, Plato's Politicus, and uh, we read almost 80% uh, uh, of the text, either in close reading or in reading with only from translation. But I use this uh, tool uh, in the close reading uh, sessions. Of course, to create, really create an aligned corpus that can be used also from others, for that purpose, it is necessary to follow certain guidelines and be very consistent about it. But in the case of the experiment, this was not an important issue. So I didn't need to uh, go through a detailed introduction about uh, the, 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 formal, the formalism and uh, the, um, the guidelines they should use in order to produce their translation. On the other hand, the Greek text we were reading, Plato's Politicus, is at least in several passages so difficult that it seems only natural and necessary to open up one and often more than one translations in order to understand it. Introducing the tool meant also nothing more than using a digital environment in order to do what we already have been doing in the classroom, compare original and translation or translations. And this was the major difference in comparison to the tree banking. We have never done such a thing like uh, what we have done with the tree banking tool in a very hierarchical and strict uh, uh, structure. What we were doing with the text alignment tool, yes, this is our everyday practice. Now, in the experiment, that I will present you the piece of the experiment. Uh, we aligned Plato Politicus. Uh, this is a passage uh, where the, uh, well, perhaps one word, Plato Politicus. The main character is not Socrates. The main character is uh, the so called guest from Elea, who is speaking with the young Socrates, who is another person. Sorry. He's not Socrates at all, it's another, another guy with the same name, but another one. Another one. Now, the uh, guest from Malaya gives in this passage a definition of what a model is. He calls it paradigma and he gives a definition. Extremely compressed, extremely difficult. The Greek is bah, horrible. We took two translations, an English, an English one, perhaps the best translation of the Politicos that we have uh, from Christopher Rowe from 1999, and a German one by Otto Appel from 1922. There is also a difference in chronology here. And I will present you some results of that. First, let's do the Rowe. 
Now, what you see here is an expo export uh, format from the tool itself. Does it work? It doesn't work here. Oh, that's not very good. Doesn't matter. Oh, I know why it doesn't work. Why did it open it in? I think we have to open it with Firefox. So for that, yeah. Okay, now it works. What the tool presents now, we have annotated the text. We went word for word, and we tried we try to see how uh, the translator, well, Christopher Rowe is much more than a translator of the politicos. He's a very important interpreter, interpreter of the dialogue. He has written an excellent, concise commentary uh, in Aris and Phillips. What we have done here was to try to map the English translation on the Greek original. What we see in the first when first glimpse is that some words, of course, are not aligned. We have the men here, which is not aligned. We have the gay here. Particles are very difficult to align them, and we know that this is not something uh, new. Uh, the tote is not used. Some more, a more interesting result, perhaps, is that also some English expressions are not aligned. So there is an indication here that the translator has to do something more interpretative, has to reformulate things in a more interpretative way in order to give kind of translation, interpretation of the passage. I repeat it, the passage is extremely difficult to understand. Uh, although the young Socrates afterwards says, well, fine et I, uh, which is, well, it seems to be like that, uh, they need to discuss uh, uh, at least um, 20 lines more in order to get it right and to understand what the guest from Elea actually means. But this is the first thing that we see. Uh, the most important here is this, although it seems not very important uh, at first, is and, because the and cannot be aligned in the Greek text. In the Greek text, we have a hypotactical construction. Here, we have a paratactical construction uh, in the text of uh, Christopher Rowe. Let me show you also the text, uh, the translation of Appel. Oh, again, with... It is clear that Appel is better with hypotaxis and uh, with trying to uh, somehow give the uh, Greek text with the German text that's as close as possible. Although, if I go through that, you will see that he has used much more words in order to, uh, uh, to uh, render one or two uh, ancient Greek words. He's, this is his way of being interpretative here, uh, using a very, very ample style to translate the Greek. What he has also done is here at the beginning to uh, introduce, insert a kind of introducing phrase in order uh, to make it more intelligible. Let me go to the last part, to the evaluation uh, of that. Now, the original was, in both cases, the reference point. That means we didn't do something that I now, I now think it is very important. We did not compare the English and the German translation to each other, which is a thing that you could obviously do. But at that moment, I have to admit, we were so fixed to understand the Greek original text that this way of comparing translations to each other 
through the tool uh, was not an urgent need. It is clear where the translator is obliged to add more material interpreting the text. It is less clear where the truth uh, whether two translations differ from each other, and that could be a point of interesting dis discussion. Some things to be done, and uh, I close here. First of all, I am extremely interested, and I think I will pursue that, uh, to build up a workflow for prose composition, which includes the linguistic annotation of original sentences and of sentences the students produce. So let them read, close read, as Mambrini has proposed and uh, other people are doing. Read them through close reading, original sentences, and then uh, annotate also uh, through the three, three banking tool their own sentences and eventually also compare them. Create a documentation that maps the ontology used for Arethusa onto the ontology commonly used in German grammar classes. And of course, compare different translations, also in different languages, of, this, of, the, of the same text passage. As I said at the beginning, teaching in a purely analogical classroom makes things not very easy, especially if the workflow is very strict and the students expect you to uh, follow this workflow. And uh, I have also some problems uh, introducing these things because they don't seem to be real, the real exercise, but it's more like a, a game. Uh, that was at the beginning. This is not really anymore the case, but I have to persuade them that it is uh, it has a purpose to do that. I am at the end. I thank you very much uh, for being here and hearing all these. And I am really very interested in the discussion to follow. Thank you. I'll turn off the broadcast now because we won't pick up any discussion anyway.